Welcome everyone to um, the last of the third Thursday poetry readings here at the Tacoma Park Community Center. Um, and the last one is traditionally an open reading where we get to um, hear members of, of the poetry community in our area, which is um, really a wonderful thing um, and an important, important thing to feel like that there really is a community rather than separate poets sort of here and there. Um, but there is, there is the sense of, of connection. Um, and the city of Tacoma Park has really been wonderful about um, allowing that to happen here by um, one, by, by um, sponsoring this reading series, which then is also um, streamed um, it comes out on YouTube um, and, is, and is also available, I think, on, on the uh, Tacoma Park TV channel so that whatever, um, whatever seems to happen inside this little room actually happens in a much, over a much wider area. Um, and Tacoma Park, you know, has, has done a number of things. One is it, it is a city with a poet laureate. Mara Leffler is our um, current poet laureate, and I'm the poet laureate um, emerita. Uh, and before that, it was Don Berger. Um, and uh, so the poet laureate has another chance to uh, really get uh, the poetry out in the community. And one of the things that I started as when I was poet laureate, was to start again a community um, a, a poetry group that meets once a month on the third Monday, usually, of the month, um, and everyone is welcome to join. It's a uh, it's a group that um, that there are sort of a steady core that come month after month, and then there are other people who just come maybe one time. Oh, they just wrote a poem and they really want to get some feedback on it or come from time to time. Uh, and so everyone is welcome. Um, and if you do come, the, th the only thing to do is to be sure you bring copies of your poem that you'd like to share. And um, I would suggest between 10 and 12 copies if you would uh, bring that many to share um, with the people in the group. Um, and I would also specifically like to thank um, Marilyn Sklar, who has been the one who makes sure that these readings really happen, that uh, the lights are turned on, that we have a really nice reception afterwards, that the word goes out into the community that the readings are happening. Um, and so we're really grateful to her. And then, of course, Sarah Danes, who's head of the um, Housing and De uh, Development Housing, commu housing and Community Development Department, who sort of um, has overseen uh, this from the very beginning. So um, um, I'm, I'm actually going to start by reading a poem um, that um, it's actually, I, I can't say that I really wrote it, um, that uh, it's, it's a cento, and a cento is a poem that a, a, a poet will take lines from lots of other poems and put them together into sort of a new creation. And in this case, what I did was actually take sometimes more than lines, um, maybe a, a suite of lines, and put them together um, and, and from one poet, um, Liesl Mueller. And Liesl Mueller um, came to this country. She was an immigrant. Um, from Germany. Her family first fled Germany. Her father, during, before and during World War II, was a radical, was a leftist radical, and so he had to get out of Germany. And so first he went to Italy, and then he had to get out of Italy, and the family came here. And so um, she does a lot with language, and um, she has a book that's called Second Language, you know, and all of us you know, are familiar with the phrase English as a second language. Well, my idea, and when I hear second language, is to think that actually for those of us who are native English speakers, actually 
English is our second language, and really our first language is poetry. Um, and I think, I think people are born with it. I think it's a way not only of uh, getting words down on paper, but it's a way of thinking, that metaphoric thinking is, um, is a way that our brain connects disparate things. And so it's really actually in a very efficient way to think. Um, and as far as I know, I mean, while computers can come up with metaphors if they're given the right algorithm, that they, that computers can't be said to think in metaphor. Um, and I think at this time, it's really important, um, communication is really important, communication between people, between, uh, as a way of um, bridging feelings of difference and distance um, and, and really to be serious about your language instead of thinking of, well, sound bites are it, you know, th that you want to say it really quickly and really concisely, which often means that you've completely oversimplified, you know, what, what the real story is and that, um, uh, you know, that really is actually a detriment to communication, even though it seems to go quickly. Um, so this, this poem that I, that I put together out of parts of Liesl Mueller's poems is called a Mueller Cento. Since it always begins in the unlikeliest places, we start in an obsolete country on no current map. I pick up a new reel, a strange sequel set in a different location and made in another language. Language, my old comrade, deserts me. Words are misused or forgotten. Consonants fight each other between my upper and lower teeth. My neighbor at dinner glances at his cuffs, his palms. He has memorized certain phrases but does not speak my language. Suddenly, I am aware no one at the table does. America saved me and history played me false. I am among these poets, a briar rose, a Rip Van Winkle, a stranger to their courage as they raise a new language out of the wreckage and evil and terrible knowledge. In the new language, Everyone spoke too fast. Eventually, I caught up with them. What will you teach me? The word deep and the word cleanse? A map of the world. Not the one in the atlas, but the one in our heads. The one we keep coloring in while the blue thread of the river by which we grew up. The careful boundaries we draw and erase. And always around the edges, the opaque wash of blue. Even now, the old things, the first things, which taught us language, things of day and night, snow, the alphabet of the dead, subtle, undeciphered, and stars, which gave us the word distance, so we could name our deepest sadness. I hand you the life you say I must leave at the border, bundled and tied. I am free. I stand in the desert, heavy with what I smuggled in, behind my eyes and under my tongue, memory and language, my rod and my staff. Stones speak up and reveal themselves as the poor of our new country, and I find myself humming the music I stuffed my ears against. I dream in rhyme in a language I never wanted to understand. When I pick up the telephone, voices from home arrive sighing, bent. We write to each other as if we were using the same language, though we are not. Your sentences lap over each other like the waves of the ocean 
strictureless. Your long, sleek, voweled words fill my mouth like ripe avocados. To see lightning as a question mark made by a trembling hand. Our message, the one we could never find the exact words for, that it was a mistake to confuse our perpetual hunger for distance. The fiction of metaphor saved us, admitting the broken connection that the world resists meaning because there is no meaning except the ones we invent. When they return to the sky, composing themselves in the ancient pen strokes that will carry us forward into the 21st century, I stand and stare at their far-flung, unreadable signature. Someone was always leaving and never coming back. To let the noise of the world make itself heard as music. I stop trying to please by learning everyone's dialect and find I can live, after all, among strangers. His heart slides down the, blue, down the tube of his instrument, blue, and comes out in a long, sweet note, excruciating and breathless like the pleasure of sex, a voice made human, a language all of us, shoppers, browsers, and purse snatchers can understand. All right. So um, what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to sit down and I will call up um, the next poet. And so I I'm going to call Craig Flaherty to come up to read his poem. My partner, Daphne, uh, grew up on a farm outside of Columbia, North Carolina. And she told me about their going out into the field and when the watermelon was ripe, taking the watermelons and, and breaking them open there and eating the sweet, juicy. Anyway, uh, that took me to a place when I was very young and I was recalling a time. Cracker Jacks, a prize in every box. The grocer hawks watermelons. We crack the green rind on the stoop. A raven lurches from the sweet flesh into the air. Dark and white seeds bounce on the step. My mother prepares cantaloupe. The summer window open above the black stone sink. A crush of monarch butterflies escape the pulpy center into green maple leaves. She breaks crown pilot crackers into my breakfast bowl. She splashes refrigerated milk on the crumbs. The summer morning sun whips the kitchen into a frenzy of heat. Baby polar bears romp in my bowl. Breakfast baked beans cool on the coal stove top. Molasses, brown sugar, salt, pork, dry mustard, 
From the dish, a fist of ladybugs escapes. A clutter of red wings crowd the blossoms printed on the oilcloth-covered table. Beating on pots and pans, my mother and I march around the house to the rhythm of the band on Don McNeil's Breakfast Club radio show. A clatter of pennies from heaven fall to the black and white checkered linoleum floor as we sing, be kind to your web-footed friends, for a duck may be somebody's mother. My grandmother lies abed in the front parlor. Her smiles wring my heart. The smell of soured milk fills the world. The odor drains into sleep, where my father holds my arms to square my shoulders. Soft feathered wings ruffle the sound of a different bell and his voice. Thank you. Hi. I have uh, just moved to Silver Spring from Asheville, North Carolina, to be closer to one of my children. Um, this poem was written for Megan Sterling, who was a teacher of mine in Asheville. And the title is Poet for Megan Sterling. Planaria's head parallel to its body Flatworms, succulent with mustard on rye. Drizzle vinaigrette over annelids when you can't sleep at 3 a.m. A cup of green tea and you're drowsy. Medicate with balm if you're anxious. One drop of bergamot sap in celery water cures the nerves. Heat stress, clay colored on the climate map. Subfusk, soil, the color of flip-flops worn till toes bleed on cement. Clay, the color of fur, grizzly, monkey, fox, or of feathers, robin, thrasher, wren. Source of militant microbes, not predators, parasites, food for thought listed in logs that the poet shelves next to jars of nut butter and peach jam, sticky on a black plastic knife, swiped across Whole Foods spelt crackers stored in clear wrap. Listening to Joni Mitchell's songs, sorting manuscripts, complex as chemical compounds, organic offals cooked or raw for study or pleasure, research a spliced moving picture, haplotypes fashioned from DNA, DNA codes, smelling of dill, sorrel, lavender, fish scales, mucus, sex, silt along the French broad, slippery to the touch, verses classified like kitchen herbs, arrowroot, borage, mint, hardy, a woman writing to claim the wilderness. Thank you. Hi, I'm Martin Fitzpatrick. I have uh, three short poems I'm going to read tonight. Uh, this first one is called Between Songs. 
And she was telling a story, a story about her father, who had cut records, some with famous musicians, but gave it up to work for the Postal Service for the steady income that would support a family. Her father, who often worked early shifts and would be home most afternoons, now and then he would get that way and bring out the saxophone and she would come home from school to find him in his boxers prowling, following the cat around the house, tormenting it with his horn. Uh, this is called The Sweet Beyond. It's nice not to be the freak. When as a youth you have been the freak, been a member of the family that behaves strangely, that are known all down the block as the freaks. It comes as a relief to look around one day and see that it appears. These people do not know you are one of the freaks. And uh, this is called They Will Not Speak. A quiet Monday morning, the National Gallery of Arts East Building is closed, except it's not closed. The building is open, only its galleries are closed. Misreading the handout, I thought more was on view, but no art is here beyond the sculptures in the atrium. I thought I would perhaps be alone with the small French paintings I have long enjoyed in a little pocket off the atrium, but they too are no longer there, nor am I alone. The atrium seems to be nearly as well peopled as all the other parts of the museum, the ones displaying works of art. The East Building's majestic, empty atrium, an international-style cathedral, will always be itself no matter what works it houses, or none, but I have never seen the sculpture folded into its vastness work so well. Richard Long's Whitechapel Slate Circle is a revelation and a fine, small Henry Moore tucked away in an obscure corner will nicely reward the hardy souls who may discover it, as perhaps in some future scavenger hunt. By the restroom stands an ironic and witty installation, presumably accidental, three very handsome phone booths with bright interior lighting, executed in clean, clear lines, warm wood and cool brushed metal, smart round stools, invoking automats and Edward Hopper, complete with phone books, but no phones. I sit and I watch. In the West Building, in the Wyeth exhibit focused on windows, I overheard someone asking, so are we talking about implicit personalizations? The question a provocation and a sealed box to me. Tourists trickle steadily up from the lower region of the building, out of the tunnel flowing to and from the West Building with its ever-shifting light array, past the merchandise and restrooms, the empty phone booths, the locked assembly hall. Look near there for the small moor you seek, filtering past the white chapel slate circle, smooth perfection formed from jagged, polished shards, like pilgrims past a dry fountain in a vast and barren abandoned temple. Slowly they fan out and through the open spaces of the building, across walkways, up and down staircases, providing a moving background to Calder's delicate, massive forms. I watch them, shades who have not been summoned to the shallow pit filled with wine and strewn with meal. The guards shoo them off when they dare to touch the fractured circle. It has fallen to them neither to consume nor even to taste. They will not stoop and drink. They will not speak. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this is a, a kind of an occasional poem, meaning that there was a social occasion, and uh, the, that's the first part describes that, and the second part is kind of a reflection on it. Um, the, the conversation that, that took place was a lot about um, things that could be measured and things that were hard to measure. So this uh, is called, At the Entrance to Great Wildlife Preserves. Here's the first part. By the time he got his PhD, our friend could quantify anything. The children who learned differently and had been told they weren't smart inhabited a quartile or a quintile of self-esteem, of satisfaction, many quadrants of performance, 
Fortunately, and the likelihood of their continuing demise could be expressed as this percent or that, as could their health, employment, even gifts to charity, if someone whispered to them, yes, that's how you do it. Draw something geometric around that so you remember. And see this line approaching zero? That is what it means that others do it differently. Except that on another graph, that line means everything. There are so many graphs, it makes you dizzy, which is, please bear in mind, a momentary disorientation to the plane and curvature of this earth as you have known it. This is part two. At the entrance to great wildlife preserves, the quantum shifts are different when you step from unbroken sunshine on the crackling leaves and walk into the Pennsylvania forests or the foothills of the mountains of Montana and Wyoming and the herded plains of Africa spread out before you like a map from luscious life on the hoof to death inevitable in all its slow and sudden forms and back. But at the entrance, entering the park, your heart will register that measurable uptick that tells you this is special. Pay attention. That is when the voice of Buddha, in as many decibels as necessary, advises you that your reaction is exactly what it must not be. And I don't know what you experienced then, but what I see is a photo of Terry on the date I first saw her that has sat in my brain for some specific number of days and will for all the days remaining in which she is wearing a very prim suit, her shirt collars pinned with a brooch, and an aura for which there is undoubtedly an intensity metric of challenge and promise in the level stare of those two dark, forbidding eyes. I uh, just graduated the fifth grade, and I am going on sixth grade. I'm nervous, but I think I can do it. Uh, this is my poem called Woodpecker. Um, and yeah. Black claws on white snow. The woodpecker's crest, a crimson glow. The sound of the night softly etching, like the woodpecker's constant pecking. Looking for bugs in the tree bark so worn. Soon the beetles start. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um. Black claws on white snow. The woodpecker's crest, a crimson glow. The sound of the night softly etching, like the woodpecker's constant pecking. Looking for bugs in the tree bark so worn. Soon the beetle's sturdy shell has torn. The woodpecker's stomach full takes flight. White spotted feathers into dark night. Black claws on white snow. Thank you. Thank you. Should I return the microphone to you? Yeah. Should I do it correctly? Yeah, that was good. Perfect. Good evening. Um, I will share two poems with you guys tonight. Um, the first one was inspired by a challenge where the um, topic was shadow. So I thought I'd uh, write about being in someone's shadow and kind of merge it in with dancing since I used to uh, dance ballroom in Latin way back when. 
This is um, Shadow Dance number two. And now I take the stage to an empty house with empty seats. Only the cobwebs come to see me. I can never quite live up to the first act, the act that everyone comes to see. I'll always be in their shadow, still playing second fiddle to a no man show. I dance the dance that nobody sees. I dance, but I do not feel free. I just feel invisible. I can't seem to draw in a crowd like the first act does, but even if I were first rate, the act that everyone loved, someone would have to come in second, come in as my shadow. Someone always has to be second rate, but that someone is always me. I still wonder, will I ever have the chance to dance center stage? And I take my bow to no applause in an empty house. There's no sound, but the sound of my steps as I continue dancing for a no man show. Okay, and the second one is called um, Dance of the Fireflies. I thought I'd share it tonight since, you know, summer's coming and the fireflies are already out. All right. Slowly as the sun goes down, it bids the day a good night. Quietly the fireflies arrive, dancing in serene delight, dancing in a silent nocturne over the streams and hills do so many small light flickers among the emerald fields. Their dance joined by children, watching them, excuse me, catching them in hilarity, seeing them dance and glow in their palms, and then setting them free. Thank you. Uh, I'm Chris, and I've written about the Triangle Fire, but I wanted to come tonight and read one of the poems in memory of the people who died in a big apartment fire that was yesterday in, in England. So this is just the... The fire that I'm writing about was in New York. The Great Divide. Henry Street, Cherry Street, Hester Street. The new world turns toward old Jerusalem. Sunrise stream on the bearded father singers standing beside a hundred rag stuffed windows. Chant the Havdalah, chant the great divide. They praise the Almighty for creating us a Sabbath that cuts one day away from the fabric of the week. Bent over singers, their backs to factory windows. Women and children stitch into sunset. Wait for the darkness. Time for going home. They piece work shirt waist under the company sign. The letter said in English, Hebrew, Italian. If you don't show up on Saturday or Sunday, you've already been fired when it's Monday. Chant the Havdalah, chant the great divide. Still, the sun drops, and the fathers pour the ritual wine into a little platter. Each strikes a sulfur tip match, touches the surface of the small wine lake, lights in the windows, dividing up the dark. Thank you. Well, poets, thank you for all your poems. It's always um, um, wonderful to hear poets uh, whose work I know um, that I'm familiar with. It's, it's always great to hear something different from them. But it's especially wonderful to hear poets that I've never heard before. 
um, that's, um, you know, I feel like that's why I do what I do, um, and that's why this series is here. So thank you very much. I'm going to read the names of the poets again just so that you have them all in your mind. So our first reader was Craig Flaherty. The second was Cl Clara B. Jones. The third, Martin Fitzpatrick. The fourth, Jonathan Katz. The fifth, Theodora A. Curtin. The sixth was Lita Varela. And the seventh was Chris Llewellyn. Let's give them all a great hand for what they did. Yeah. So this is the last reading of, the, of the, this 16-17 uh, um, season. Um, starting in the fall again in September, we'll begin a new season. And we hope to see you there. Um, and uh, again, I want to thank the city of Tacoma Park for their support for poetry. I'd also like to thank the people from who do all the AV work um, to both preserve what we've, what we've done, the performances, but also to see that so many more people um, beyond the confines of this room get to enjoy um, what we do here. Thanks so much. <laughs>